Yeah. Hey, excited to be sitting down with Carrie Lloyd. Carrie is a friend of ours and um, I felt, felt very randomly I bumped into Carrie, but it, it, when I left, it was like, no, this is bigger than random. Like this is the Lord, he's setting us up. Carrie, I actually bumped into her in a doctor's office a couple weeks ago, a month ago now. I was there because I had some kind of, I thought maybe a broken bone in my body. She was there to get vetted and cleared for her physical, her health, so that she could foster. And when I left her presence, I was like, well, we are fo we're focusing on foster care awareness and what it is that's happening in the nation around foster, fostering. And I think, Carrie, nobody more brilliant to talk to than you. You have so much insight and wisdom and passion and I just want to hear from you. What are you doing? How is it that you came to become a potential foster parent? Well, I'm firstly, I'm terrified of the prospect of being a foster parent. And I've been delaying and procrastinating for as long as I can, to be honest with you, because I, because I have quite a nice life and I travel quite a lot. And uh, I'm certainly living it up as a single at the age of 41. But I had always, ever since, sorry, I would say around about my mid twenties, I wanted to adopt or foster. Actually more adopt than foster. I was nervous about fostering because I was worried that I would just be grieving all the time every time they left. So I had this prerequisite about what I wanted. I wanted to adopt before nine months old so I didn't have to worry too much about trauma or abandonment issues. You know, the, the, the trauma would be on a smaller scale if we got a little before, you know. And then I was having all of these non-negotiables about adopting a child and, you know, I'd have to raise 50 to 100K just so then I can afford to go through private adoption agencies because I'd heard about the foster care system. And so I had all of these rules and, um, you know, and, I, and obviously one of them was to be married. And um, so I sort of went through the 30s and uh, sort of just took the ball by the horns, really, as much as I could in the opportunities of my life. And by the time I was getting into my mid to late 30s, I went, Lord, you know what? I really do feel very impressed to do this to do this and I was having dreams I was having very vivid dreams I would share them with mentors and advisors and they'd be like it's time to research it's not time to act so I did a huge amount of research over the last sort of decade I would say but more specifically so in the last two years and um I started working on the orphan myth campaign which was this really brilliant convener model that basically brought 30 NGOs together and they were all looking at two different parts of it one was domestic which was wanting to reform the foster care system in America the other part of it was to deinstitutionalize orphanages in the world mainly because our generosity as a church um, was slowly what we're learning is essentially being taken advantage of because we have been as a conglomerate as a stakeholder the church in the US donated or are donating one billion dollars a year to orphan welfare across the world, which is extraordinary on the church's behalf. The problem is it's been seen as a business and the children's, the children's interests are not being put to the best. And so we can see, we are seeing some increasing numbers in child trafficking. We're seeing a huge amount of neglect. We're also seeing, um, you know, at least every three out of four orphans actually have at least one living parent. So reunification is in a sort of strong focus. So I started to learn a huge, huge amount of the importance of re reunification, trying to get the family back to their biological family if they can. And then I was learning that the US foster care system were doing the same. So they're trying to prevent methods of children separating because the trauma is so extreme. It's as extreme as if um, to be in the foster care system than it is just to be at home in, in forms of abuse. So. What they're trying to do is to rehabilitate the families better so then the children don't have to be separated because of course we're very loyal as children um, and if we've even got a difficult parent we can all, we can understand sometimes why they're in that space and we want to hold on for dear life so there's these 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 journeys these stories these individual stories that i was learning go wow all of those prerequisites that i had of adoption were only for me they weren't based on what's best for the child and so when I started to get my head around, well, how can I be useful? I was also, a lot of the time, people in the church were suggesting that this wasn't my calling. I need to be wary, being single as a female. We didn't want to promote that families were only single parents. 
And it was very painful to listen to because I'm, I'm, well, firstly, a lot of my friends ended up being single parents because they didn't plan to be, but also these children just need some love. Even mm. if I'm not going to bring the full package of two full parents, they need someone that's safe and steadfast and they can't be in and out of foster homes all the time because that's incredibly traumatizing for them as well. So the, the little that I can bring hopefully is still something and enough to help redeem a little bit of their story. And they really just need consistency and steadfastness. And then you cultivate a family, even if you don't have the traditional type of family that you have. So you have a lot of uncles, you have a lot of aunties, I have a lot of male. Um, my friends share their husbands for the fatherly things of these guys, you know, of the kids that they, if they need some father time or they need some masculine energy around them, then it's, it's important for me to be able to find that. So, the last year has just been me. This is a long answer. Lance, I'll, make, I'll make sure I'll give you space to talk. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the, <laughs> um, the, the, where I'm at now is I, I'm now in foster care training and um, I've been learning all of the things we need to know in regards to trauma, um, navigating what they need, um, and also learning a lot about ourselves, how we were brought up by our parents, what we learned about discipline and and all of the things in between. So um, I've had home studies, I've done all the training, I've done all the water first day, CPR stuff, all that stuff. We just, we're just waiting now for final approval. What sticks out to you from that training specific to trauma? So they're, they're exposing you to some of the background to children in general, like some of the children you may encounter. What sticks out to you in terms of their path and what they've had to endure? I think what's actually happened an awful lot is the word of mouth marketing around foster parenting isn't all that fantastic. So you often see me people where they're burnt out, exhausted, 50% of foster parents, for example, drop out in the first year. Yeah. So wraparound support is one of the most important things that we need to have in the church. Um, and I don't know whether there's enough oomph, enough clout um, from the church for wraparound support at this particular moment in time. A lot of people say, oh, I don't have a grace for it. I don't, I don't know whether that's really for me. Or they're nervous even of becoming foster carers because they're worried about the trauma of the child in foster care having an, a bad influence on their own children. So there's lots of reasons why people don't want to. However, these are all reasons that can be overcome, taught through, worked through and solved. So these, these issues are solvable. I think sometimes we're choosing the easier road in all of this journey, rather than the more noble path, which is often a harder path, but it's a more rewarding path. And so um, what I was learning in the training is just how much we have to learn about the why parents are in the position that they are by having to have their children in foster care. So instead of labeling them on their behavior and looking at behavioral management, we're actually looking at the why these children are in this situation. And you find yourself having a huge amount of compassion, not just for the children, but also for the parents as well. Because that can't be easy, having your own children being taken care of by somebody else. Yeah. It's very, very painful for them. Um, and so it's, it's very inspiring watching foster carers develop good, healthy relationships with the biological parents in the, in the hope that they could redeem all of this and actually we can reunite the children back to the homes again. And a lot of them do go back. So that's encouraging to know. And I didn't realize how much of a high percentage of children actually can be returned back to their original families. But we do have 130,000 in America right now. Actually, I think it's about 122,000. Um, it came down a little bit in the, in the last administration. Um, Lynn Johnson, who was you know, brilliant within child services, she um, did a fantastic job of including as many people as possible, taking away the politics, taking away all the diversity that can take place and then and essentially divide people. She was trying to bring everyone else and making sure that the children were the number one concern. Um, and so there's 122,000 that legally can't be returned back to their parents for whatever the reasons are, and they have to be adopted into another family. That's the part that I really want the church to stand up and we're not. Yeah. And back, back to that 122,000, that would be because the parents simply are not fit to take care of their children. But yeah. Children's Services is supremely devoted to children being back with their parents, but they do have boundaries to say no when the parents just, they, they just can't do it. It wouldn't be safe for the child. It wouldn't be healthy for either of the, I mean, most of the children, but 
So yeah. it's good for us to know that, that like Children's Services is doing that work and they do draw that line, but their hope, their hopeful intent is to get kids back with their bio families. Yeah. So you just said, I want to go back, back in time a little bit when you were talking about that. Sounds like a cooperative you were working in. Yeah. You made, you made the discovery that this is big business and inside of the big business, there's some exploitation taking place. What do you mean by that? Are you talking about um, like crime or are you talking about the way uh, coverings and services, provide services just breaks down? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? Um, there's actually a really, really good podcast on, uh, it's called Maybe God, Cod, sorry, let me say it again, it's a tongue twister, Maybe God podcast. Okay. And they did the podcast by two parents that adopted internationally from an orphanage. And they discovered when they flew the child back over, yeah. that she started talking about her mother as if she was still alive. Yes. And they'd actually been told by the agency that were adopting that the parent had died. Okay. So there can be a lot because of the money that um, can be cultivated and just the weight of how much our money costs over there in different countries and third world countries. Um, it's extraordinary to look at how the orphanage itself has been now used because of course it's our mandate as a church to take care of the orphans and the widows. But what's happened is that they've gone, oh, this is really good business for us. If we're yeah. sent tons of money to orphanages, we make really good business. So we actually need to just, instead of emptying orphanages, we'll just keep filling them and then we make all this money. Well, that's not actually the, to the, to the, that's the detriment of the child because they're not getting individual love and care and they do need to be individually championed and they do need to be individually seen and looked after. Um, and so that's why we got rid of orphanages ourselves many years ago and why we just had the foster care system to try and assign these children a match with the, with, with the right family yeah. needs are. And when you were talking earlier about when fostering doesn't last, Fostering doesn't last for a few reasons. One, that family is ready to take their child back to them, which that's a beautiful thing. Like you yeah. want that to happen, but that would hurt as a foster parent. You're saying goodbye to a kid that you've developed rapport and love with. Or two, fostering doesn't last because maybe the foster care themselves just burns out. Like they're just like, this has been so taxing. I can't handle it. So it's probably those two cases. Yeah, it's it's it is a huge reason why, you know, that the the government is bursting at the seams. The caseworkers are bursting at the seams. They're trying to utilize all of the, you know, and any any kind of misbehavior from the child or any note that is made about what the child just experienced. We have to do visitations with the biological parents. Um, so there's lots of there's lots of work involved. Um, but I think when I started talking to others, especially as a single, I knew I didn't have a teammate to just pop out to the shops and take care of the kids for five minutes. So I'm like, gosh, this is gonna be quite a lot for me to navigate. So I started interviewing a lot of single foster parents, people like Peter Mutazbazi, who was an amazing story. He was a Ugandan street kid back in the day and he changed his life around. Uh, someone picked him up, believed in him, gave him food and board and education, and then ended up growing up with, um, I think he was on the streets for about four years and eating food out of garbage cans and then was picked up, given education and food, flew over to America into his thirties and ended up sort of going into social services saying, I've got a spare room if I can be of help at all. And they said, have you ever thought about being a foster parent? He said, well, I'm single. So I haven't really thought that through. And they said, well, that doesn't matter. These kids just need love. Mm -hmm. And um, so he started fostering. So I interviewed him and have stayed in touch with him. And sometimes I'll just, um, he was the one that inspired me just to go, just anything is something, wraparound support, you know, so ordering pizza for a foster care family is such a gift for that family because they don't have to cook that night or, and you can do it from the, from the comfort of your own sofa on Grubhub, you know, you can just, there are ways and means to do it. Um, another friend had called me saying, I was just thinking we need to write down a list of equipment that you'll need that can cover certain ages. If you're taking ages of five to 11 years, then we need to write down the equipment that you're going to need so you don't double up because of all these different ages and we've got clothes and we've got some things that we can give you and we've got books and 
you know, it's it's been incredible actually. And that's why I moved back up to Reading for a while because I knew that my community was so brilliant at this stuff. And I need that, I can't do it on my own. They say that it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes a city when it comes into a foster care system because you're involved in the government as well. And yeah. so, you know, and this is my having learned so much with the Orphan Myth campaign and, and being so inspired by all these NGOs. We're not asking people to stop funding orphanages. We're just asking them to divert their funds to more intricate, more um, localized expertise so that we can actually really start focusing on what the children need. And of course, none of these children ask to be in the foster system. None of them want to be in our homes. They want to be with their families. Mm -hmm. And so it's a heartbreaking journey for them. But it's an extraordinary path that I've been so inspired by watching my friends do it. And also, it's just the, the Lord just shows up in places that are just extraordinary. And I'm, I'm tired of us talking about pro-life and, and all of these things. And we wear the red tape on our mouths and steps of abortion clinics, but no one's actually taking these kids in. Yeah. So you know, I remember sitting with someone that was an atheist and they said, well, you know, I had an abortion because I chose, chose to, and I, I, I know how dire the foster care system is. That's what they were saying and how overburdened it is. So I didn't want my kid just stuck in the foster care system and I couldn't argue it. So I'm like, I, instead of us shouting about the problems, we need to start bringing the solutions and I can't preach about it unless I'm actually doing it myself. Yeah. So now I kind of wish I'd chosen another, another subject. <laughs> Because I'm now terrified, and this is this is getting real. And I don't know. I I think I've shared with you um, when they came in to do a home study. She's been in that. The social worker's been in this for 17 years, and she was looking around, going, "Well, what's lovely about this house? This is old, and the, and the walls are really solid. So when they do punch." If they shouldn't make much of a damage. And I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, also your valuables, you want to hide those away from them. And, but she was so nonchalant about it. And I thought that's how we need to be. We need to kind of go, oh, bless them, you know, <laughs> and just kind of let them go on and recognize our need for steadfastness is more important than us being frightened by, you know, angry, upset behavior. So I think, mm. I've been inspired by foster parents because there's some of them increased in confidence watching them as they've gone on their journey because they're like, gosh, things that used to frighten me and terrify me just don't happen anymore. And I've this amazing character has been built in them because they recognize, wow, these kids just need consistent love, which is all we really needed from our Lord, you know, and we make decisions all the time that weren't the best for us. But it's just uh, that in itself, I think, is changing just even how I see the Lord see us, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of your, you said you've got some friends that are inspiring you. I, th I think Danny is one of them. We've interviewed her here. Oh. What, what about her has inspired you? Like what? Well, I mean, she's got five at the moment, which everyone goes, sorry, what? She's five. single. She's five. Okay. But she's killing it, you know? And um, I talked to her an awful lot about questions, you know, questions I have of like, is my life going to stop completely now I'm doing this, you know? Um, and so she's been a real inspiration to me on just the logistics of the day to day, the running, the running, the making sure taking care of yourself um, to make sure you're taking care of them well. Um, and, you know, I got to sort of spend um, a few hours with one of them on my own after they, you know, had a little bit of a temper tantrum and break a laptop. Yeah. So now they're going to raise money for, for so I was like, oh, I can give him plenty of jobs here. So I took him out for pizza and listened to his story. And I was just, he was just such a tender, sweet, beautiful kid. And I, I could feel myself weep inside going, how is someone this sweet, so tender, being given such a rough childhood, you know? And yet at the same time, he still has hope and still has this amazing, I don't know, almost work ethic, even his work ethic. How he cleaned my car was better than anyone else I've ever seen in my life. He just had this most amazing, like thoroughly focused on what he was doing, you know. Yeah. And so they're just, just learning. I love stories. And I actually, so I'm so inspired whenever I hear someone overcome something. And this kid is overcoming things. So I'm like, oh, I'm not here to save you. You're here to save me. Yeah. On something, you know. Wow. Um, yeah. Danny's fantastic and, and, and I think you know what I like about what she's done is she's involved people in 
you know, she's ensured that she's asking for help and she's doing what she needs to do for herself and for the kids. And it's been amazing to watch the wraparound support just as much as it has been for Danny, you know, because they're as vital, I think, as, as we might be. And there's people like the Bird Society that do, they do, um, it's a brilliant nonprofit, I think, that basically does their focus on wraparound support and a retention rate for them. If the foster carers are involved in the Mockingbird Society, they have 10 foster, um, they have 10 families around one foster carer family and they call them hubs. And so the retention rate for those ones, well, they stay in it much longer. And they also have this amazing ability to just um, to stay in it. So I think the retention rate is like 97% after I don't know how many years. It's extraordinary, really. Um, and so I'm always interested in the character of people that take this on, you know, because it is it is a the the one thing I, America's Kids Belong. The uh, the president is Brian Mavis. His, his wife Julie Mavis messaged me saying, "Your life's never going to be the same." And I was like, "Is that a good thing?" <laughs> and uh, she said, "Actually, it's um, no, it's really going to change your life." And uh, I really believe that. And all the people that I've met have been so inspiring, just as people, just incredible characters of faith, of resilience, of steadfastness, and just have this incredible ability, like our Lord, to go, why are they doing that? Not, I can't believe they're doing that. It's, I wonder why they're doing that. Yeah. It's well, it's not like proximity too, like you're, like it's another space where the Lord brings together people from different walks of life and different backgrounds and different experiences to strengthen each other. Like you yes. said, I, I'm not saving him. He's saving me. Me hearing his story of overcoming is making me a fuller person. feels like that's the Lord. Like he's always bringing the ends together to integrate and like there's wholeness, right? Yeah. The other thing in my mind, as I'm hearing you talk, um, what, like, what does the wraparound look like? And what's the name of that org you're talking about? The 10 families to one? That's the Mockingbird Society. Okay, the Mockingbird Society. What, what does wraparound look like? Because again, I think there's like grandiose notions out there about what is foster care. And then we mm -hmm. talk to people that are behind the curtain and it's like, no, no, it's, it's, it looks like this. It's probably yeah. simpler than we think. It's so and basic. What's wraparound? Well, it's, it's everything from, hey, we've got equipment if you need it, to uh, do, you want to, do you want me to take the kids off your hands for two hours, um, to, hey, we're going to the pool, I'm going to take the kids, do you, want, do you want me to take yours? You know, it's all of those things that give, it's the burnout. So it's the two, because you're dealing with trauma, yeah. the parents are going to need some more time out, potentially, than others. Um, you know, sometimes the kids are running away. Sometimes the kids are just playing pranks all the time. And they're, they're doing anything for attention, but they're also trying to push you as far as you can go to see if you're going to stay. Wow. And a lot of, even in foster care families, they go. So yeah. if you know, if you're coming into it, this, this kid is going to try and try and sabotage and try and get rid of me. If you know that, because he just wants to see how much you care and you're willing to stay with him. And there was an amazing TED talk by a guy, who's now an adult, he said he went in and out of foster care, he was in and out of jail. And the one guy that transformed him was a guy that didn't have much personality, didn't really do much for a living, wasn't really all that fun, but he was consistently there every time he needed him. And he said, that was the guy that changed me. And that was the guy that transformed me. And I think that in itself is, is testament, if we can, to the church. But I think we get, sometimes we get too cozy as Christians. Sometimes we ran to the church because it was a safe place and it was the kindest place we could find. Whereas I'm like, the, the Christians that inspire me are the ones that are on the front line and are fearless and courageous and actually running after the very one that everyone else let go of. You know, it's that stuff because that we, that's the beauty of our faith was to get, make us that resilient. And sometimes we're still only operating at our own strength. Whereas fostering this whole journey has made me go, I'm about to operate way outside of my strength and capacity and I'm terrified, but, but it doesn't, that's not going to stop me. Just we were talking, we were talking about this in an earlier time. You had some, you, in your research, you've done some amazing research and found out some stats that were really empowering yeah. about the number of kids in need of a home 
and the number of potential homes available to those kids in the church. Do you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, there was, well, I remember there was one state where there was something like, or oh, in that particular town, sort of 526 children and only 47 foster carers. And then there, and then anyone aged over the age of eight in the foster care system, um, only 1% of people will look at fostering them or adopting oh. them after the age of eight. Okay. On top of that, <clears throat> um, you've got the stats of connecting the dots. So if everyone's involved in so, which is a great subject for you, the social justice matter of foster care system is intense. So if you look at the, um, I read a stat which said 75% to 80% of sex traffic victims in Los Angeles actually were in the foster care system. 75% of those incarcerated in America were in the foster care system. 50% of homeless were in the foster care system. It's a huge part of the dilemma that we have on, on social justice issues. And so if we catch this thing upstream, if we catch upstream and start really putting our efforts and our focus onto the foster care system, we might actually reduce a lot of the economic nightmare that we have. And obviously just the sole nightmare that, that those people are going through because they weren't given much steadfastness earlier on. Um, and then there was that lovely, I think I, I think I talked to you about that lovely story of the, the 14 year old that had never been like one of the solutions we're learning is a lot of people hear the statistics like I just gave a lot of people hear the stories but they, again they go well I don't have a grace for it um and they hear some of the nightmare stories all the, the difficult children and so they go oh, I don't know whether I don't know whether I could but what's happening is um America's Kids Belong which is a really brilliant um concept in my mind and probably the most successful one that's been taking place in America they basically asked the question why have we got 400,000 churches in America and we've got 122,000 children that are looking to be adopted but we're not clearing that number if we've got the mandate why are we not clearing that number that's only one family in every three congregations so why why are we not doing this and the, the answer was it wasn't familiar, it wasn't relative. So they started building enough trust with the governments in certain states to be given the list of children that were legally now able to be adopted. And um, they would film, they would spend a day of filming each child for four or five minutes and ask them questions about themselves, what family meant to them, what their favorite color was, what they like, what they enjoy to do. And it's essentially like a mini audition on tape. Um, An audition sounds like the wrong word, but it generally is them just sharing who they are and showing their face and just hearing their voice. And what they learned was if we start projecting these videos both online and into the church communities, then people will go, oh my God, that's our son. And they won't even recognize that they've just had a grace for it even when they didn't realize, even when they would say they didn't have one, they see the face of the child, they hear his voice or her voice and fall in love. And they go, what can we do to get that, get this child? We need this, he's supposed to be in our lives. Or I had the word Michael, Michael, Michael. Why does Michael mean anything? All of a sudden, Michael comes up on a random video on heartgallery.com and they're like, oh, that's Michael. So the inquiries went through the roof and actually where America's Kids Belong have been able to establish with governments, the ones that they filmed, 50% of the children that were filmed were reduced and finally given a home a forever family and that was in one year so the stats are extraordinary but we just need more of that we need more people to actually have an open heart if they've been on the fence of going we've been thinking about it that at some point we've got to start going no, we're going to do this you know yeah. and just try it out and if it can't be you if you don't have a spare room or you're traveling an awful lot then there are other ways to do wrap around there is no one exempt from this everyone can do something and I, that's where I started to recognize, my gosh, this would all be so much easier if we just had a moment of focus on it and actually educated the church for what we actually need to do for the orphans and widows. And it hurts me when I see that how few churches are actually doing anything about the orphans and the widows. And so currently, currently the church, like statistically, really isn't stepping into that gap or responding to that need. I think... I mean, I have thoughts on that. What, what do you think it is 
that that gap persists or the church isn't moving towards that need. Again, like generally speaking, the, we're talking about the broader church of America here. Um, Cause I, I mean, my speculation is the proximity issue that we, we don't see the need. We don't, we don't brush up against yeah. that story. And you know, the pe you took that the pizza, your friend's foster child took the pizza. You heard his story and that becomes another element of like glue. Yeah. Like, wow, man, I, this guy's path, amazing the way he's living. So what America's Kids Belong is doing is putting the story out there, it sounds like. Yeah. Is it just that or is there something else that's keeping us in this kind of distance? Well, even if they saw the video, for example, let's say everyone had access to the video, there's still something personally in us that is terrified. Terrified of the unknown, terrified of the unpredictable. We like to have control on some elements in our own home. And then terrified also of the loss of the child. So if we get too attached, and this is why I didn't want to do fostering. I just wanted to do adopting because I wanted to keep them. And so they know they're mine now. And so, so I, I was very aware I was still protecting myself. And when I started to learn and really get knowledgeable on some of this stuff, then I recognized I've not once asked what's right for the child. Yeah. I've not once asked that. And and then I really had to look at myself and why did I not ask that? And that was a whole personal journey that, you know, I won't bore you and I don't even bore the therapist with. But the reality is, is that I wanted to, I wanted to do right by this, the social injustice of it all. I used to be a pregnancy crisis and, and a counsellor back in the day, 10, 12 years ago. Okay. And um, I would see the journey of how few people were giving up their child for adoption now. It was either they were gonna keep it themselves or they would have it aborted. That third option was no longer really around. Mm -hmm. um, the shame of it, the guilt of it, the guilt of giving up the child and then giving up the child into a foster care system that feels so drowned already in so much work and paperwork and, and case, you know. Um, I think what has been brilliant are the likes of things like Care Portal, where you can just go onto careportal.org and then type in your zip code. It then emails you every time there's a need in your zip code. So it might say twin mattress needed or um, mother can't um, afford to pay for radiated bill this month. Um, so then it'll have churches come in and go, oh, we're happy to give $200 or happy to. So that's always been very good as well, because I've liked to learn what, what the need is for care portal in, in that particular area. Um, and that also adds onto the wraparound support. So care portal have done a really good job on that level. Um, but I think if there's been an interest in you, and, I, and of course I was doing that thing of procrastinating, going, oh, I'm just gonna wait for the husband. But I did give myself the milestone of like, I'll wait until 40. And if we get to 40, if I don't see any change necessarily with the, on the guy front, then I might just have to do this alone. And then I had amazing stories hearing Rita Springer once I bumped into her. You know, when you start to inquire and talk to the Lord about this, he starts bringing people that you just randomly bump into. And Rita Springer talked to me a little bit about how the Lord had basically fathered her adopted child when she, I think she adopted around about the age of 40, so the same age I am now, and she adopted her son and was talking about how the Lord would wake him up in the middle of the night if the child needed something. Just wow. really beautiful stories. You're like, wow, I, I wonder how much I've actually given my life to, to trust him that much on yeah. those moments. I wonder how, if I've done that. And so that for me, I think has been, again, wanting to stop trying to have it all in my strength and have I got what it takes? Yeah. And stop asking those self-questioning questions that don't help. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's crazy because we as Jesus followers, probably our primary pursuit in life is we want more of God. Yeah. We want to be closer to God. And everybody I talk to that's in the foster space, whether they're wraparound, whether they work for the government, whether they're fostering, I just hear story after story after story of God is so much closer to them. Like, yeah. like they're, they're living in a, in a realm of intimacy with God. Totally. That to me makes me extremely jealous. I'm, I'm like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think there is because it's the adoptive spirit, because we're choosing to love these ones. And I remember someone, I was dating a guy back in the day. And this was a guy that I, we were thinking about marriage and all that kind of thing. And I remember his mother turned to me and said, oh, you'll never love them like your own. 
And I remember when we were talking about adoption, I remember this just surge of like, yeah. what? And I was just so mad at the prospect. But then I was like, oh, is that true? I don't believe that's true because you adopted us. Yeah. <laughs> like this, how is, how is it working? And I just remember then I would be meeting adoptive parents going, oh, we've got biological and adoptive and we love them just as much as our own. If anything, probably a little bit more. <laughs> because because we, made, we made a choice of this one and, you know. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. So, so any question or fear that I have, I always bring up to the Lord and he always answers it, you know, pretty quickly with either a beautiful testimony or a story in front of me or this ability to just, um, my curiosity, I always feel is led by the Lord and he always feeds it. You know, it's this lovely mystery that I go on. And, and so I, I'm almost nervous even to talk about it now because it's just its beginning. You know, what if I fail miserably? What if I fall on my face? And, you know, I've got 12 kids that now hate me, you know, <laughs> because I did a terrible job or just don't like my accent. You know, there's so many things that they, but I'm, I, it's worth, it's just got to cost you something yeah. and I think sometimes we come into our faith and we don't we don't think it should cost us something because we're so loved by the Lord but I'm like no that kind of love is worth worth it costing me something yeah. and and every time I've allowed it to cost me something it's been one of the best stories that I've ever experienced or some of the finest miracles I've ever encountered yeah you started you started talking about how you were making really detailed lists and when I have this and when this is together, yeah. so it sounds, like, it sounds like that has been replaced with a mindset. Okay, what's best for the kid? Yeah. And do I have a spare room? Okay. Yeah, much that. Yeah. Because you do need a spare room. <laughs> yeah, you need some like practical resource. Okay. Yeah. Um, if it's respite, uh, they're less funny about respite because you know they just might be with you for 24 48 hours something like that yeah. um but if you're actually taking kids in for a few months here and there um then yeah you, but i think you know i'm probably at some point i'll do a bit of a crowd crowdfunding to go hey guys I've, you know my my room is not a child's room so i need to change that into a bunk bed and yeah. i need things for it and it's costly you know it's 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 it you need a decent fund to begin this with but but then also you're you're financially supported once you get going it's just yeah. the initial stuff so you know those kind of things but, but you talked the, about like a city it's a city that raises a child so you're like your intention is to to be wrapped like you'll experience wrap around and you're going to be pulling your friends in and even what you just said i'm going to do a crowdfund like i'm going to make sure people know what i'm up to and i'm going to need yeah. them because I can't do it alone. Sounds like you have that mentality. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and, and you know, people going, gosh, that's amazing. You're like, thank you. Is there anything we can do? Yes, <laughs> actually there yeah. are. Um, you can tell me, talk to me about what books have been really helpful for you for raising children. Um, yeah. I was speaking to other foster families ago, the, the, um, the Connected Child is one of them. You know, there's lots of different books that can help advise you on these things. But I'm and um, every story is different. So even when you feel like you're getting conf confidence on how to raise a child, you get a different case and then all of a sudden it changes. So I've been told. So I'm very aware that, you know, formulas, again, a bit like pastoring, pastoring you'll, see, you'll notice this, Lance, right? When you have 60 people in front of you, you have to pastor them 60 different ways. There's no formula to it. And I think it's the same with children, but I'm so fascinated with humanity that I think it's it's certainly something that I needed to be stretched in. I'm a bit bored. I need to be stretched. And I, I like learning and I like being curious of stories. And so if I can learn their story and also be hopefully a help to the... There was this amazing thing that I saw on Instagram the other day. I, I follow a lot of single foster mums and foster parents on Instagram. And um, there was this picture and it was a diaper bag with some bits and bobs in it. And it had a little list on it and it said, these, this is how they need feeding, when they need to be changed, when they sleep. Um, and then um, this foster mother said, and she's really looking forward to cuddle with her mum. And it's this very sweet encouragement from the foster mother to the mother to say that, oh, she misses you rather than I'm doing a better job, <laughs> you know, which is not what anyone needs, but it was just this really sweet, I was, I, I was weeping 
because I was seeing foster care is still willing and, and ready to give this child back whenever the mother's ready um, or father, you know, whatever the case is. But it's, it's been pretty stunning to watch, you know, how people have humbled themselves. Which again, I mean, again, that just sounds more like God, like it's a bigger view of the world. It's yeah. not just thinking about yourself and you're thinking about others. And it's simple for us to talk about here, but yeah. we know as humans how, how small our hearts can be sometimes. You know, we, yeah. don't, we don't live very nobly. We don't live big. We don't think expansive. Mm -hmm. so and that, I mean, awesome. even, if, even if you're a business owner, I mean, and this is one thing that AKB have done in another state, which I'd love us to try and do in up here in Northern California, is businesses are giving discounts to foster carers. So car salespeople are going, we'll give you, you know, some money off for the car. We're trying to make your life e easier because it's you've chosen a tough path. So when you have businesses, coffee shops, um, crash in a gym so that the foster carer can go off for an hour and just take care of themselves for an hour whilst the kids go and play. There are all these different opportunities that it doesn't have to be just for a friend. It can be businesses and small businesses actually funding into and giving into discounts or just some, some way of helping on whatever it looks like or yeah. foster hour, you know, where you're doing a happy hour for the kids at Pisa, like whatever it looks like, there are ways to give back even if you can't personally cho choose this in, in itself. Um, right. Yeah. Because, because that sacrifice and the choice, the love is pointed at making a healthy family. And like you said earlier, you're quoting the statistics of um, drug addiction, incarceration rates being connected to broken families. So when families are made whole, man, the whole, I mean, the whole world looks different. It really does. So it's pretty simple. Yeah, and I and I think it'd be quite interesting to see in the net. What we've been trying to do to raise a voice in regards to the whole orphan welfare campaign is what people were trying to do 10, 15 years ago with anti-sex trafficking. Okay. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're, but it's taking it's taking a lot to get the churches because you know I reached out to 200 churches, 10 responded, 10 responded. Yeah. And that and that's including people that I know. This isn't just like what are you what are you, calling. what are you hearing from churches like if maybe they get back to you and say sorry or you just don't hear from them at all? Like what what's the demographics on why the church yeah. is coming? A few things. One is bit bit busy, bit too busy, can't do it right now. Okay. Second, is, second is we get pulled on a lot by NGOs and, and non-profits and I'm like that's so interesting that you thought that I was coming in with that angle and I'm just saying can you just educate your church that we need to do a better job of fostering not do orphan tourism and not be uh, funding orphanages but actually do localized expertise like so they're, like, education so they were saying no we don't have money for that but you were yeah they're like that's great we don't need money. We just need you to re-educate the church. And we just need you to start spreading the message around. Um, and then it would be, you know, or, or they're wanting to get more involved in sort of make more localizing. But I think, I think what's happening is either the movement's gonna come from the con congregation towards, it used to be when the pastor was fostering themselves, you would see a much higher number in fostering mm -hmm families in the church because they were inspired by the pastor or a leader at the front that was taking on this journey of saying yes but often that can also go through private agencies not necessarily through foster care system and and not everyone has that kind of money and i, I recognize there can be crowdfunding for that but we really do need to look at the foster care system because these are the ones that are, they they that's where they end up most of the time there was also a statistic, and I don't know if it's still accurate now, but a few years ago, 80% of babies that were born in Mercy Hospital had drugs in their system, which means as soon as there's drugs in the system, they're removed. And I remember being in NICU one day, praying for a little baby that had just, my, parent, my friends had just um, had, and they'd just become parents, and they wanted me to come in and pray. And I was in NICU, and there were 10 babies, all in these incubators, with no parents. Just, just us with this little baby girl that we were praying for. And, um, 
And that was a pretty heartbreaking image because I'm, I'm like, a, I, 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 I was part of the statistic that wasn't taking care of them because I was getting specific about what I wanted, that I wanted to be a baby, that I wanted to be this, that I wanted to be that, that I, and I'm like, that doesn't, again, feel very like, Lord, here's my yes. <laughs> here's my, here's my conditional yes. <laughs> with, mm. with all of my, with all of my lists. And instead I've gone, what, what age range do you think I would be good for good, considering I have to work, I'm single, five to 11? Okay, five to 11, great. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that and, and try to land this thing. How, how does the church get involved? And, and I think we can talk about the, the large church structure. We just talk about people. Like, what do people need to do to start engaging? And Pastors, yeah. Pastors all those steps, yeah. Pastors need to ask uh, and find out all of the ones that are fostering. They need to, they need to, if, you know how, how Bill did a brilliant job of like getting all the veterans to stand up or getting all the mothers to stand up or the single mothers to stand up in the church congregation. We need to do the same for fostering. Um, we need to create communities that go, listen, we'll be on standby if you need a meal train or if you need carpooling or if you need two hours time out. So people that, a, a big roster of people that they we can reach out to. So we're not pulling on the same people all the time. Um, equipment, things, gifts, donations, money, you know, for the foster carers, because even though you're supported by the government, it's not a huge amount to be able to support them. Um, uh, you know, if you're owning a business to give, you know, if you're running a sports center, then to offer either childcare for an hour or two, or, you know, discounted rates for the foster carers themselves, like certain things, and it sounds very entitled in some way, all of this, but I'm also going, if you want to get involved, if you want to help ease it, if you want to add the numbers to foster carers in the system, we've got to make their life easier and not just expect them to just run on their own. So it helps with the, with the church making that a social justice issue. This is how the early church started with taking care of the babies that were abandoned and left in the gutters. And so we need to not forget that. We need to be, we need to be reminded that this is a very big grievance on our Lord's heart and we can actually do something and wipe the tears off his face by bringing these kids into our home. If we've got a spare room and we, and we might've had our children leave after them now they're in their 20s um i've known people in their 50s and 60s still taking in kids for a bit you know yeah. and help reunify so i think i spoke to some a woman in louisiana louisiana and i was like gosh i'm i'm 41 am i gonna have the energy to take care of the young ones and she went sweetheart i took on a i took on a toddler at 48 so you're gonna be fine i was like okay, okay. So it's those things, just those those moments of hope and belief and encouragement and um, checking in with the foster carers, but just learning who are, who's doing it and just calling up um, agencies in your local area, you know. And uh, I remember the agency Youth and Child in Reading, one of the one of the social workers said, can you have a chat with your church? Because I thought this was all supposed to be about adoption and taking care of the orphans and widows. And uh, it'd be great if some of you guys would be on board. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair. I'll see if I can chat to them. But um, yeah, and I think just getting rid of the narrative that says I don't have a grace for it. Paul Kuma, who's just brilliant and uh, such a phenomenal pastor. And he says, that's rubbish. If you say yes, you'll be given the grace. And I think that's true. We, we can't doubt ourselves too much and just recognize rather than disqualifying ourselves from a hard task, give the opportunity for the Lord to show up in a way that he never has done before because you never gave him that much trust. So, so let it be a new season for our own learning, you know, and our own intimacy. Right. With him. It's beautiful. Did that land it? Oh, this is, uh, yeah, so inspiring. I'm so glad we're talking to you. You have so much insight and wisdom and really excited for the, the path for you, the journey you're on. You're about ready to have have some kids come into your space. I can't wait to hear how it's going. Hopefully I can be like- I can't a, wait a, to meet Uncle Lance. Do something, yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna need you. <laughs> so yeah. Well, you let me know. And I will. Whatever I can do. And again, yeah. thanks for, 
thanks for your yes. Thanks for being an example. Um, I think that's a big prayer of mine that, that there'd be more of those. This would be a shift that the church would start to be known that we're, we're engaging in this issue, not, not straying from it, not avoiding it. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty telling that somebody that works for a foster care agency, a foster family agency would ask that question of you as a yeah. Christian. Hey, where is your church? Why hasn't your church shown up? Yeah. That's, Heartbreaking. That's pretty inciting to me. I'm like, whoa, okay. They're thinking yeah. about us. And yeah. Thinking about us in that lens. Wow. Because we've also got that narrative of everyone's going on, the, everyone's trying to get rid of us now out of the workplace, out of the government, out of public domains. And I'm like, well, this is an amazing opportunity where they're like, no, we actually need you. We actually need your help. So. We need to do the manpower and and stop expecting that someone else is going to take this on. You know, we've all got to take it on. And then it becomes less burdensome. So I think also I want to finish with how do, how do people find you if they wanted to connect with you, see any of the projects that you're up to? Um, well, I'm on Instagram at Carrie Gracie. I have a podcast, although I haven't actually recorded a podcast for it for the last six months, um, but I will. Um, and I'll probably do one on fostering, actually. Um, and then that's called the Carry On Podcast is on iTunes and Spotify and all that jazz, Podbean. And then um, I have a Patreon account, which is a lot more personal. It's a lot more honest about my journey day to day, journey of being a pastor, but also being single and all that jazz. And that's on Patreon. So, um, yeah, called The Vignettes by Carrie Lloyd. And so um, those are just musings three times a week um, that for a, for a coffee a month, you can subscribe to it. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. So, so encouraging getting a few minutes thanks, with you. Yeah. I really, really appreciate it. It's the, such an honor. And thanks for doing all that you're doing, you know, and thanks for being the voice for justice. And, that, you know, we need it more than ever before. And you've been such a gift to us in our community. So I, I can't help but think we'll have private conversations behind the scenes about what we can do with the city and this entire subject as I go on the journey and learn more. You know, I'm sure there's stuff that we can do. Well, no, there, there is going to be some more conversations. We, we've already been talking about you and with my team, we've been having some okay. very carry conversations. So we'll be reaching yeah. out because I think for us, for us, we're all about, you know, the big idea, the landscape of the earth, but then what needs to happen in our hometown. Yeah. We're, we're very much invested in our hometown here in Shasta County. And you've already shared two or three ideas with us that we're like, okay, we want to try to take action there. So we'll, yeah. we'll pull on you, we'll get a coffee and see if anything can materialize here. Be awesome. love that. And I would say that as we wrap up, it's like, you know, I say this all the time, but it's like, do what you can do where you're at. And it's good to dream, it's good to think big, but what about your own town and where your roots are going down? How can you be invested to, to be a part of the solution? And it really is that simple. So Carrie, you're doing your part, thank you. That's a pleasure. All, all the best. Bless you. Jesus loves you. It's been good. <laughs> you guys joining us. Uh, make sure if, if you're connecting this moment and there's something going good for you, there's some inspiration, some encouragement, some wisdom. It, it helps us when you spread the word. So hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, spread the word around your network, people that know you. And we're just, yeah, we're trying to get these kinds of words out to make justice less less of an elective and more of a central issue for us as Jesus followers. So thanks everybody. And I'm saying goodbye to you, Carrie. God bless you. Goodbye. Thank you, my friend. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye.